All right, good morning KCFR. We're uh, excited to bring this uh, video to you today. Uh, we're here with the new Engine 11. You can see it behind me. Um, and we're getting ready to put this in service. So we wanted to put together a little video to introduce the engine and the new rescue pumper concept. This is a new tool in our toolbox at KCFR. So we thought uh, no better way than to get the message out than all of us uh, doing a video together. So the first thing I wanna do is in, uh, thank all of the people involved in this project. First of all, I wanna thank the commissioners who, uh, you know, sometimes you have to make uh, lemonade out of lemons. And we had a wreck last year when engine 14 rolled and we, uh, had to make a quick decision on getting a new engine in service and figuring out uh, the best way to do that and, and buying a demo was our only option and there weren't a lot of demos and there were, were certainly not a lot of demos like what we had already and so this kind of led us down the path of being able to think about a new concept and with the rescue pumper so I want to thank the apparatus committee that got involved in that uh, and quickly got with Pierce and we made some recommendations. I want to thank the commissioners for their support. Obviously without their support we wouldn't be able to uh, to put good products like this and safe products on the street for our citizens and our firefighters. I think as we showed with the uh, rolled engine you know the, the Pierce fire trucks do an incredible job of protecting us and being safe so that's uh, you know safety is our paramount and, and most important thing we can do. Uh, and then I want to thank the team that's put this truck together since it's been here. Obviously, all of the people at the shop, Jared, Matt, Todd, Kyle, have all been instrumental. And then Chief Kapal, Chief Harwood, Captain Brown, Captain Whaley have been instrumental in making sure that each piece of this is uh, really well thought out. And I, uh, I spent about an hour at the truck yesterday going over it with uh, Chief Kapal. And uh, I'm thoroughly impressed with how they laid this out. I think as you see the video today, you'll be, uh, you will equally be impressed with the forethought that went into this and really the product we're putting on the street. So uh, just to talk a little bit about why we chose this vehicle and kind of how it's gonna change, maybe how we operate just a little bit. I think we don't lose sight. The reason it's called a rescue pumper is obviously it's a multi-capability truck. I think the most important thing that we need to not lose sight of is it's still a pumper. Uh, it, it does all of the things our other engines do. It has 750 gallons of water. It's a 1500 gallon a minute pump. All of the things that every other engine we have does, this engine does. It just enhances the capability by having more space. And we've been able to really move a lot of the rescue equipment over to this engine. So it has all of the heavy vehicle extrication equipment on it. Uh, and we're, we're getting a new set of tools. We're still waiting for the AFG grant to see if we get uh, a new set, whether we get all new sets of rescue tools or whether we just get one set. If we get one set, it's obviously coming to this truck. If we get multiple sets, then we'll replace all of the old AMCAS and TNT sets that we have left. But this has all the vehicle extrication. It has all of the rope extrication. I know that makes Firefighter Clausen extremely happy as we go through this process. He's filming me right now. So that was the only way we could get him to do this is if we put every ounce of rope that we had uh, on this truck. So we're really excited about the uh, concept. I think, again, you'll see as you take a tour of the truck that this is really a, a solid and well thought out piece. The rescue pumper concept is new to KCFR, but it's not new to the fire service. I think that if you look and see uh, departments as we continue to grow and get bigger, when we were two stations and three stations and even four stations, it's really hard to specialize and branch out because you have to be a jack of all trades and maybe not a master of any. And I think this allows us, you know, we've seen it a little bit with our ladder company, and now we're gonna be able to see it with a rescue company as well, uh, that, they, um, that they really are able to specialize and bring some extra tools to a scene on an everyday basis that maybe we weren't ever able to do in the past. This does not erase the rescue truck. I know several people have asked whether we're gonna get rid of the rescue truck. It does not do that. The rescue will be still attached to this vehicle. Uh, in terms of being stationed together. The rescue will become really more of a toolbox. We won't be having first out gear on it uh, and things like that. We're really more focused on it's gonna be uh, bringing collapse and trench capabilities to a scene. And it really can be brought by anybody. So engine 11 would respond. And then if another station or one of the chiefs or some support people need to bring the rescue truck to a big scene, we can certainly do that. But this puts us in a position to get more equipment on the scene faster. We've got all the ALS equipment uh, on this truck. And I, like I said, I really am just pleased with how this all came together. Can't thank the crew enough and the team enough for uh, their hard work on this. 
and I'm excited. My goal, uh, and we talked this morning uh, with the shop, my goal is that uh, I think Blue Shift really led this project, so I'd like to be able to push it into a push-in ceremony and have its first shift next Wednesday, the 7th of September. So uh, that's, our, that's our primary goal, and uh, I think Blue Shift should get to run the first call in this truck. So if we can do that, we'll push it in next Wednesday and see how it goes and start running rescue calls and uh, fire calls and, of course, EMS calls all with this great new apparatus. So enjoy the video. Thank you guys for your support. Enjoy training on it. And uh, again, thanks to all involved uh, for getting this ready to go. Hello everybody. Welcome to the familiarization video for the new Engine 11. Uh, it's, it's a Pierce Enforcer HDRP, uh, stands for Heavy Duty Rescue Pumper. So there are some significant differences from our normal engine spec. Uh, this video is going to take us through some of those differences um, and then uh, some of the equipment locations and then that'll all be followed up with some hands-on training before we put this in service probably next week. So beginning with uh, some of the significant differences, number one this this truck is two and a half to three feet longer than our normal engine. Uh, it's a 34 foot length it's a uh, similar height, so 10 feet, 6 inches, and then it, it weighs fully loaded uh, 46,500 pounds, give or take. So a little bit longer um, and a little bit heavier. Uh, in the cab here, you'll notice that the first thing that you'll see when you get in here is that we're back to a multiplexed system. So this does have a command zone, which... Uh, basically gives the engineer or officer full control of all the systems of, on, the, on the apparatus. Um, there's a lot of screens to go through. I'm not going to do that for you right now. That'll be something you can play with when you, when you guys come down for hands-on training. Uh, some of the other obvious differences are, uh, well, we have a, a, a rear view or backup camera. Uh, we do have the wireless Firecom headsets. And uh, another nice thing is that on the steering wheel, we have a lot, of, um, a lot of the controls you can be operated from the steering wheel console here, including your emergency master and some of the other um, lighting features of the truck. Again, uh, you'll be able to familiarize with this when you come down. One other thing that is a little bit different is we do have the air horn and the wind-up siren at your foot pedals, but we also have a Waylon uh, radio control head up here which uh, has the electronic sirens too so it's almost a cross between an ambulance and an engine um, and both are fully functional so it's it's up to the engineer or officer how you how you do your audible warnings when you're responding in emergency mode from there we'll move on out of the cab and we'll begin a walk around of the truck the next thing you'll notice in the rear is we have forward-facing uh, firefighter seats. So two forward-facing seats. Uh, immediately next to those seats, we have the, the gear storage compartments for your turnouts. Uh, EMS compartments are now facing, facing the rear. Uh, NARC box, battle lanterns, glove holders, uh, all the helmet holders are all mounted so that all of our equipment can be secured. On top of the EMS cabinets, we have uh, storage for RTF gear. So one side will hold the vests, the other side will hold the helmets and the go bag. Uh, there is a couple loose items of equipment that are still yet to be mounted. Uh, that will be done before you guys get down here for the hands-on part. Hopefully our firefighters are happy with the forward-facing seats. I think it's a lot nicer to be able to see where you're going. Moving on from the cab, we'll go to perhaps the biggest difference from our normal engine spec is our, our pre-connect package here. So what we have is a cross lay up top, which is our blitz line. And then below it, we have two speed lays, which are our, our normal inch and three quarter uh, cross lays. So to deploy these, the orange pull tabs will release the netting. So for the cross lay, pull the top one. Now the cross lay is accessible. For the speed lays, same thing. 
pull the orange tab, the netting comes down, and now our pre-connects are, are there and available to, to be deployed. Uh, the difference between a speed lay and a cross lay is that the speed lays aren't accessible from the top, so you can't load them in the traditional fashion. Uh, each one has a tray that actually slides out. So um, once, once it's time to reload your hose, the tray comes out, and then the hose gets reloaded and pushed back in. Uh, these trays aren't meant to be deployed uh, during a fire attack. Obviously, the hose just comes out and deploys out of it, um, the same as it would out of one of our cross lay beds. Uh, they are double stack now, so again, some more hands-on training. Um, they deploy from a lower proximity than we're used to pulling them out above our shoulder. Now you're going to have something at waist level, so I encourage everybody to spend a, a decent amount of time deploying these and then reloading them just so we can re-familiarize and, and be used to the difference. For the pump panel, this is a 1500 G GPM uh, waterist pump. It's internal workings are a little bit different than the, the, the previous generation of pumps that we have. Um, it has a mechanical pump seal, so there's no packing glands or anything like that. Uh, the shop may be producing a video that kind of talks about the differences. Uh, it shouldn't affect us as the end users. It's still a 1500 GPM pump. Uh, water is the same as we're used to. Uh, the pump panel configuration is obviously a little bit different than what we have on our other ones, but uh, all the handles are color coded. So we do have the green for the blitz line, the blue for the bumper, uh, yellow and red for our two inch and three quarter pre-connects. Um, the intakes are the same. The pressure governor is one significant difference here. So all the functions are the same. The only difference is, is we have a, a turn dial for your throttle versus the up and down push buttons that we're used to. Uh, again, all the functions are the same. Um, it's just a little bit different interface when you're uh, controlling your, your RPMs or your pressure. Uh, we have the Trident Air Primer, so uh, that's the same that's on Ladder 13, and I believe 1V07, the wrecked engine. So one more thing about the pump panel that we felt important to know. Uh, for the, the two crosslays and the blitz line, they have automatic drains. So when you charge the line and put pressure to it, it pops the drain shut and it behaves normally. As soon as you shut the discharge and relieve the pressure on the hose line, the drains will open up automatically so your lines will drain without having to actuate a lever. Moving on to compartmentation, we do have a command zone light up top. The controller is here. It's uh, a little bit different than the previous generation of, of uh, command zone lighting. So it's a pneumatic actuated tower. So it does take a bit longer to deploy, especially if you're not high idling, because it runs off the same compressor that runs the brakes and everything else. So uh, when you go to deploy the command zone light, just understand that it takes uh, air pressure to charge the telescoping tower. And unless your RPMs are up, uh, it might take a little bit longer than you'd expect. Um, and same thing with bedding. It has to bleed that air down and allow it to, to uh, retract. Another difference here with the engineer's compartment is that we now have a drawer system. So we do have all of the engineer equipment that would be standard for an engine. Uh, adapters, appliances, reducers, all that stuff are all in these drawers along with some other things. Uh, I can open them one by one later or you guys can just familiarize with this when you come down. <clears throat> Another significant difference is the slide out, vertical slide out tool boards here. So these are designed to come out. The engineer's SCBA is located here. All of our spanners, piercing nozzle, um, mallet and wrench for the foam pails. 
we do not have foot trays on our pump panels, so our pups are now stored here. Uh, the five inch and the three inch are right here in the engineer's compartment. Um, and then on this other tool board, Uh, mercury monitor, low profile strainer, and some more adapters. And then on the back side over here, uh, foam pickup tube. The planned place for the engineer to keep his turnouts is right here. Moving on, driver's side. SCBA bottles, we are going to, I believe there's 11 spare SCBA bottles on this rig, and we're gonna try to maintain that package so that we bring more air um, to structure fires and things like that. So SCBA tubes, you'll notice the fuel fill cap is here in the SCBA compartment, so it's not visible without removing it. Um, in the high side up here, this is kind of where the rescue equipment begins. So you can see our Rescue 42 is mounted to the exterior of this tool board. And then behind it, we have the Rescue 42 bag. Uh, we have hand tools like our, our sockets and our ratchets and um, wrenches and things like that are, are in a backpack now. Behind that, we have our Milwaukee complement. So there's uh, impact driver, drill, grinder, and then in the DeWalt case, we have our Milwaukee Sawzall. Moving on from there, basically extrication here. Uh, airbag complement, airbag controller, second uh, air controller that can be used to charge your struts with air. The Paratech struts are here in these Pelican cases. It's the same as what you've been trained on on, on the Heavy Rescue. Uh, we, we're only carrying two of them though, instead of the four that come on, on the Heavy. Below that, we have our hydraulic extrication tools. Right now we're carrying the TNT set. Uh, the intention will be to have hydraulics here um, as soon as we can. But for now, we're running the TNT. Moving on to the rear. Some more significant differences here. So starting with the lowest shelf, slide out shelf, cribbing and step chocks. Above that, in this closed compartment, you will find the hydrant bag and our two ladders. So we have the 24 foot single fly extension ladder and then the 14 foot roof ladder. Uh, above that, we have the five inch. These buckles you should be used to from the other rigs. You just need to unclip them, grab your tail and deploy your five inch like normal. And then there is 650 feet currently. And then the same with the three inch. Next to that, uh, hard suction on either side and uh, a couple pike poles and your attic ladder. Obviously the, the ladder here is how you access the top and we'll, we'll go up top later after our walk around. Coming around to the officer side rear, up top we have our RIT complement and our salvage tarps are all on that top shelf up there. Uh, next one down is our saws, so vent saw, K12, hydro ram, the associated blades and bar oil and things like that. And then on the lowest shelf here we've got one grip hoist and the associated cables and chokers that go with it. We have the come along, and then we have a chain basket where 
you will find both grade 80, the good stuff, and grade 70, the transportation chain, all in the same package. So it's one-stop shop for chain. Again, SCBA tubes. These uh, little retention straps are simply a redundancy that's built in there. If you forget to close a compartment, the SCBA bottles won't go shooting out. So please try to try to dress these with the strap around the neck until you need them. Uh, officer side, high side. Exterior is additional firefighting tools, the same as it is on the other engines. And then behind that, we have wildland complement, bolt cutters, and then all of our long handle tools. So your shovels, your broom, your squeegee, uh, there's a Pulaski in there. And that will also be where we keep our tire chains in the winter when we carry them. Three more SCBA bottles. Moving on to the officer side forward compartment. Uh, what you'll notice when, when you start to familiarize with this truck is that our bumper is a little bit different. We do have a bumper line, a uh, hundred foot uh, triple layer, inch and three quarter. However, there's not enough room for the wildland hose to fit in there with it. Also, the discharge is not as accessible. So we're carrying our wildland package a little bit differently now. You will have to access it from this roll-up compartment, bring it to a discharge, and then deploy from there. And this is where you're going to find the hose complement. Below that we have absorbent, decon buckets behind it, spill kit, and a hose clamp. We do have the quickie blowhard fan, which is kept here. And then below it, uh, the little giant has its own little nesting spot down there. Then we have extinguishers, another slide out tool board. So wet can, ABC, and then on this side we have the firefighters irons. And our traffic cones. You'll also find a couple sets of spanners in this forward compartment here too. This side of the pump house is similar to what you're used to. We have your LDH discharge, and then we have another intake and one, um, the number two passenger side discharge is here as well. The, it does have shore power, uh, 200 foot, 20 amp with the uh, junction box. And then the uh, cross lays and the speed lays again, function the same way by pulling the orange tab that gives you access and then we deploy it how we normally would. There is a little compartment down here that is going to have a, um, a, shore, a shore connection for air so we will be able to do some dry decon or refill tires or whatever whatever use you might have for that. This is where a coiled up um, air hose is going to be. Officer's hook, uh, secured and mounted here. And then the cab on this side is just a mirror image of the other side. We'll move on to the officer's seat. Similar to our other engines, uh, MDTs mounted, battle lanterns right there, uh, radio head, and everything else. The fire, fire comm control system is up there, so I think once we have that dialed in, we'll probably have to leave it alone, but uh, that is where that's located. Moving on to the bumper. So this is what I was talking about. There's no external discharge up here. The discharge is actually at the bottom of this compartment. So the reason why we're not carrying wildland up here is because of how cumbersome it is to remove the triple layer, get your arm in there, uncouple the pre-connect, and then proceed with the wildland connection. It doesn't mean you can't do it. We just don't have the room for the 300 feet of hose that we would normally carry. Uh, other than that, your triple layer will deploy the exact same as it always has. It's just the discharge is hidden down in there. 
you will notice on this truck it, it has um, a significant amount of more scene lighting than what we're used to. You'll see the giant brow light up there that basically facing forward, it turns night into day. And then there are a lot of body mounted uh, LED scene lights as well. So this truck will uh, essentially turn night into day. Um, a lot more lighting than we're used to. I think from there we can uh, we can transition to the top and go over where the rescue equipment is. Okay, top of the truck. So we do have four coffin boxes up here. What we did was kind of try to divide it up like it was on the rescue. So you'll notice here in the driver's side forward most compartment, we have almost our entire confined space complement. Everything that you should need is in there with the exception of the SAR cart, which is actually forward in the officer side coffin box. Uh, the stokes with the litter bridle and the backboard that fits inside of it are kept here right now. And underneath that is the vortex and the 400 foot ropes. Moving back from there, we have the litter wheel and all the rest of our rope rescue equipment. So there's two over the edge kits. There's um, all of our 200 foot ropes. There's the hardware, the software, the harness bag. Uh, driver's side rear coffin box is currently all of our bundles. Uh, there, we are still exploring some different solutions to make these bundles more accessible from the ground. So stand by for future developments on that. But for now, they are right here. This, this coffin box is the closest proximity to the ladder to get up here. So we figured the, uh, it was the best place for the bundles. Again, uh, we're trying to work on a solution to make those more accessible from the ground. The other big difference you'll notice is that we do not have a covered hose bed here. The only thing that retains the hose is these two Velcro straps. So for the engineers, just make sure that these are tight and secured down. Because this is the only thing that's going to keep your hose from jumping out of the bed. Uh, again, this hose bed was designed to carry a lot more 5 inch than we currently are carrying. Uh, there's no plans to, to change that. So it is kind of a bit of a step down from uh, the level of where I'm standing down into the hose bed. Uh, when you try to ex access stuff on this side, you, it is necessary. Um, it could be necessary to walk across the hose. So uh, it is what it is. Moving forward from there, you have your uh, water fill and your foam tank access from the top. The deck gun is the same as what we're used to. And then you can see the night scan um, light tower there. This truck does have a generator to, uh, to run all the auxiliary power systems. So that's also located up here. And where I'm standing right now is just, I'm basically standing on top of the water tank. So the reason that the hose bed is able to be as low as it can is because uh, this is an L-shaped booster tank. So I'm actually standing right on top of the, the booster tank right now. And then it goes down and it does extend underneath the hose bed a little bit. But that, that's how come we're able to lower this hose bed as much as we were. I don't have anything else to go over up here. So in conclusion, enjoy the hands-on part of this. Uh, make sure we put special emphasis on deploying those cross lays because they are different. And then just familiarize uh, thanks for your time.